Well, thank you very much, uh, Ula, for the introduction. And, and thank you very much, everyone, if you rushed your lunch in order to be back here um, at uh, 3 o'clock or thereabouts. I know that um, I've learned the lesson that you never get between a vegan and their dinner, their food, because they're um, very much food obsessed, or at least I, I am food obsessed. Um, if I speak like this, can you hear me OK? And if I move the microphone around, can you hear me like that? No, OK. So um, what I'm going to do is a presentation which is going to, to uh, draw from my experiences of being um, a vegan and, an, and full-time involved with animal rights since 1976. And this is a selection of the organizations that I've been involved with. And the totality of my experiences with these organizations informs the work that I do today, and um, and I consider myself to be someone who's continuously learning um, more. And one of the reasons why I wanted to come to this conference so much was because I wanted to learn more about what's happening for animal rights in Eastern Europe. Um, some of these organisations you will know, um, some you may not. Uh, Lantern, in the, I'll go very quickly go through them. Lantern uh, is the publisher of my book called Growl. The organization below that is Alica Allies. Um, they are one of the uh, client organizations I'm working with at the moment. They're based in uh, Washington, D.C. in the USA, and they focus on uh, street cats, community cats, uh, uh, feral cat issues. The Vegan Society, I've been on the board of trustees. I'm currently serving as uh, one of their scientific advisory group members. Minding Animals International is an organization that I, uh, is my pro bono client. I donate my time to them as executive director. And what we do, uh, well, I'll come back to what we do in a second. At the top there in the middle is Compassion World Farming, who I'm sure many of you know. I currently work with the chief executive on writing and researching materials for him. The Animals Agenda magazine. Did anyone ever see the Animals Agenda magazine? Any hands up, please, or oh, one or two of you? Um, this was a magazine that I published in the USA uh, for about nine years. Um, the internet um, put to death a number of magazines, and Animals Agenda, sadly, was one of them. Peter, I'm sure you're all familiar with them. I was their first executive director from 1987 to 1992. Um, BUAV is now called Cruelty Free International, and I was a number of, among a number of people who, in the 1980s, uh, radicalized BUAV and turned a very staid anti-vivisection organization into, into a very vigorous one in the 1980s. And then lastly, Animal Society Institute is an organization that uh, I helped co-found, and that works as a think tank on animal issues. So you, there's a, quite a broad cross-section of organizations and different activities that uh, I've been involved with and continue to be involved with. And as I say, the sum total of those activities is very much informs me and the presentation I'm making. Out of those organizations, two things I want to focus upon. One is Alicat Allies, and this was a book I produced for them last year to celebrate their 25th anniversary. I've never worked directly on cat issues before, until just over a year ago, and I have really grown to appreciate how complicated cat issues actually are. Um, we have cats who live uh, in our homes, but there's also cats who live outside, and th there's a huge difference between them um, and a range of differences between them. And, uh, and if I have more time, I would love to discuss them with you because it's a fascinating subject. Um, and the other example I want to focus upon is Minding Animals International. And what we do is that every three years we partner with a university and with sometimes another organization that is an advocacy group. And we produce every three years an international conference on animals and uh, society. On the, st on the study of animals and their relationship with us. So we have a conference that attracts, depending upon the, the location, uh, between 400 and 700 academics, advocates, public policy makers, and anyone who is wanting to search more out about a deeper meaning about what it means to care deeply about animals and our relationship with them 
and wants to apply their advocacy into public policy, into, into research, um, then I would highly recommend that you go to mindinganimals.com and sign up for our bulletin, and then you'll hear more about the conference, our next conference in, in Mexico in 2018. Is that 18 down there? I haven't got my glasses on. It's 2018. Is that right, 2018? Yes. Thank you. Just making sure all those potatoes and starch haven't sent you to sleep. So the presentation is in three parts. I'm going to talk about four key values, three traditions in animal ethics, and five stages of social movements. And I'll refer back to this slide, and we'll come back to this. This is a series of signposts to help you navigate our way through this presentation. So the four key values. When you write a book about uh, your experience in animal rights, it forces you to really put into order what it is that makes you think and feel and behave the way that you do. And I, uh, the best way for me to, 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 to put into words what is for me the essence of what it means to be an animal rights activist. For me, and you may feel differently, and that's perfectly entitled to you, but when I say that I'm an animal rights activist, there are four key values that I focus in on, and they are compassion, truth, nonviolence, and justice. And we will spend a few moments looking at each one of these four. So compassion speaks to the connection um, that we have with animals, our motivation for helping animals. And the reason why I chose compassion rather than sympathy, pity, or empathy is because for me, compassion is the emotion that connects me to animals and compels me to want to take action about it. So in contrast, I might see a situation where an individual is suffering and I might feel pity for them, um, but I'm not compelled to do anything about it. Or I might feel sympathetic to them, I might be able to imagine how they're feeling, but it doesn't compel me to do anything about it. Empathy is another way of saying that I can imagine or experience what that person or that individual is experiencing, but still not compelled to do anything about it. So for me, compassion is the first of my four key values because it means that when I see a human or animal suffering, whether it's on the streets, in the countryside, or it's online, and I, I can immediately connect to whatever it is that that individual is experiencing. And I, um, I feel compassionate toward them, I want to stop what's happening to them, and I'm motivated to do that. So compassion for me is our connection with animals, and, and that connection is compelling us to, to take action. And in writing Growl, I had to look back on my life and think, what was it that led me to where I am today? And you know, I had no, there's nothing special or extraordinary about my upbringing. I was born to uh, working class parents um, and, and raised on a council estate in uh, south of London. Um, but I know that in the town where I was born and raised, there was this lady called Camberley Kate. And I can remember her when I was five, six, or seven years old, that she had that cart, that wooden cart, and all those dogs um, tied to them. So she, she saved, she rescued all these dogs. And we might think now that that's perhaps not the best way to go about it, but that was then. And looking at her now, I feel that she very much would have been someone who I think probably we could all connect with. You know, she, I don't know whether she was vegetarian or not. To me, that's not necessarily important. But the fact of the matter is, is that she dedicated decades of her life to rescuing and saving these dogs. And she was someone who was very visible within the community. She did not hide herself away. She drew attention to herself in her own inimitable style, which was pushing this wooden cart with all these dog res des rescued dogs that she had through the high street of the town, Camberley. And people watched her, they gave her money, they gave her some dog food. And I can remember as a child looking at her, looking at her and thinking, she scares me. Um, but why does she do what she does? And, and my mind was not formulated to figure out what it was. But I know that when I look back on my life, I know that she had a big impact because I can think about her quite vividly to this day. So to me, she personifies compassion. 
She connected to those dogs. She wanted to do something about those dogs. And, and she was a fierce advocate for those dogs. And, and you can tell by that photograph how fierce she actually was. She was very short, very small, but you did not want to cross her path. So for me, that's compassion. And I know the, with my work with animal rights that I meet people like her all the time who feel compassionate about animals and are motivated to do something about them. And this is all of you in this room. So my second key value is truth, which is talking about the ethical relations with animals. And I think part of our job is to expose the truth about our complex and confused relationship with animals. And again, looking back, when I was writing Growl, I had to figure out what it was that made me become aware of the truth about our relationship with animals. So the next slide um, is uh, not pleasant, so I'll warn you now. And what this is, is a photograph taken within a chicken slaughterhouse. Because when I was a student in 1972, I worked one summer in a chicken slaughterhouse. And I never worked on the uh, killing part of the production line, but I did work on the post-killing part. And I um, bagged up the chicken carcasses into plastic bags, which were then put into, um, uh, into a deep freeze. And I did that as a student. I needed to earn some money. I was very poor. Um, it was a summer job, and I knew that I was going to leave it um, and go back to my final year at college. So when I went back to college, in the year below me was the only student I knew at that time. Her name was Mandy. And Mandy and I had a good friendship, and I couldn't wait to get back after the summer and play the big macho I am about how, look what I've been doing in the summer. I worked in a chicken slaughterhouse. Aren't I marvelous? Aren't I great? Can I make you upset, Mandy, with all my stories? But she fought back. She argued back with me. And in, over a period of time, some months, we would have this argument. And at the end of 1973, I realized, and, and I worked in the, in the slaughterhouse in the summer of 73. So it shows you how thick I am. It took me from the summer of 1973 to the, to the end of 73 to realize that what, I had been done, what I'd been doing by working in the chicken slaughterhouse was actually wrong. Am I speaking too fast for everyone? No? OK. Um, and uh, I became a vegetarian at the beginning of 1974. And what I had, now I look back on and understand, that happened to me was that I had a personal transformative moment. So a personal transformative moment is when something happens in your life when you realize that the veil of secrecy that hides animal cruelty and exploitation is suddenly lifted and you see it. And um, I'm sure you probably all had at least one personal transformative moment. And these photographs are just ways to illustrate um, what they may be. And they come in many shapes and sizes. So it could be that you went to a circus and you saw, you know, as a child, you saw a performing bear and was outraged by it, and, but you didn't know what to do about it. And so, but consequently, later years, it comes back to you and haunts you. And that was a personal transformative moment. It may not actually transform you literally from being uh, a non-vegan into a vegan, but it's laying that path whereby you make that choice. It could be that uh, you go to the zoo and see um, a big ape, big gorilla, or it could be that you saw um, what uh, I would call the suicide food of animals, where you have the animal that's a life-size model of a bull in Heathrow Airport that I happened to photograph on a recent trip through Heathrow, uh, a child sitting on top of it, and you know it's selling beef burgers and so on. And to me, you know, you think, why can't these people see what they're seeing? We can see that that's an animal, that's not food. But at one point, I think probably we all did see that it was and uh, food and, and not an animal. So personal transformative moments, um, they are a combination of institutional arrangements, linguistic slights of hand, 
and defensive operations ensure that animal exploitation persists in its invisibility. Animal exploitation is going on all the way around us, and often we don't see it, and it's being presented in a way that, it's, that, that the animals are celebrating us killing and eating them. And this, the illustration is an example of something that's called suicide food. They die for our, they die for our pleasure. So knowing all this stuff that we now know about animal exploitation, um, and knowing increasingly how I think the world is going to hell in a handbasket, it can make you feel very negative and misanthropic and not like people very much. So um, in writing Growl, I wanted to be honest with myself and with my readers that I needed to say to them that I actually end up feeling very angry, very frustrated, and frankly hating people. And I coined the phrase that I end up going into what I call the misanthropic bunker. So this is a photograph, not of me, it's something I found on the internet, of me visually looking as if I'm walking down the misanthropic bunker. And the misanthropic bunker is a place that I know I go into when I'm really fed up with animal rights, I'm fed up with the struggle, uh, I'm fed up that we're not making any progress, I'm angry and upset because I've just learned about yet another area of animal exploitation, animal cruelty that um, I didn't know about, and I think I must have heard everything by now, but I still discover new ways in which animals are abused, and I just retreat into the bunker, and I go there. I go there self-consciously, self, in a self-aware way, but I also know that while I'm there, I, you know, I can rant at the world, I can complain bitterly to my partner or to anyone else who will listen to me, but I know that I never do anything organized. I never do any animal rights work whilst I'm in the misanthropic bunker because I know that work will not be positive. It will not be good. But I let myself sit in the misanthropic bunker and rant. I might have a drink or two whilst I'm in there eat something, but then I get myself out of it because I know that I need to be out of the misanthropic bunker and back f performing for animals functionally in, a, in a, an effective, positive way. How many of you care to admit that you go into a misanthropic bunker? Well done, there's quite a few of you. So that resonates, that idea resonates with you that you get misanthropic. There's nothing wrong with it. Just keep it to yourself, don't share it, because we've got enough of our own, thank you very much. So also with the misanthropic bunker, you can feel really violent and that you want to strike out. Um, and the third key value in my four key values, what animal rights means, is nonviolence. And I'm a firm believer that what we are doing in campaigning for animal rights is confronting the violence that we do to animals and exposing it and getting it to stop. And you cannot stop violence with more violence, I believe. So the third key value is nonviolence. It speaks to our values in the relationships we have with animals. And one of the things I want to share with you is that, you know, I've had many cat. my partner and I, we've had many cats and dogs over the years. Um, we didn't have the one in the bottom right-hand corner, I'll quickly add. But the one on the left here, Emmy, who sits very comfortably in that chair, um, the top right cat is a, is a feral cat. Um, but these, you know, we want to have relationships whereby they are compassionate, they're honest, they're nonviolent, and we give them justice. So with one species of cats, we see that there is different situations, and we've got to articulate our concept about animal rights to fit each of those three situations. And violence has no role in it. But as I'll come back to later, it's, we are not the ones who cause the violence to animals. It's what we call the animal industrial complex. But it's them that cause the violence to animals. So the last of my four key values is justice. And we now move into a little bit of the, of the philosophy side of things, uh, which I'll come back to also in a little while. So justice, I see justice for animals as an issue of equality, fairness, and duty. So with equality, it's to ensure that the law recognizes animals like humans as sentient beings in their own right. 
in an order for them to receive their due legal protection. I'm a great believer in our need to get laws onto books that protect animals, that gives them their own right to live the life that is due to them. The second aspect of justice is fairness. To require the law to protect animals appropriate to their needs as subjects of a life and inherent rights. I'll come back to subjects of a life in a second. I realize I'm going through this quite quickly. I'm sorry for that. Um, you can read it more leisurely in my book. Uh, justice, duty, to insist that individuals in society respect and enforce justice for animals. So three aspects of justice. And here we have the four key values of compassion, truth, nonviolence, and justice. Is everyone with me so far? Yes. So, in thinking about truth, compassion, nonviolence, and justice, I was wondering one day what it was to be the opposite of that. It's lies, indifference, violence, and injustice. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized that we, as the animal rights movement, as animal advocates, we are, we are arguing for truth, compassion, nonviolence, and justice. But when we talk about the animal industrial complex, which is a term that's been used to quantify all the commercial, non-commercial, interests, institutional interests, traditions, which defend and perpetuate animal cruelty and exploitation, to me, their relationship with animals consists of lies, indifference, violence, and injustice. And in a way that I quite like that way to depict uh, making sense of what it is that we're all about, because it shows very clearly the dividing line between our values and their values. And I know that defenders of animal exploitation, they'll accuse us of telling lies, when of course it's them. They never really tell the whole truth until they're forced to do so. They are indifferent to animal cruelty and exploitation, otherwise they wouldn't be doing it and making money out of it. Their behavior, their justifications are the violence that's been caused to animals, and they don't see the injustice in which they're caused. So I find that a very helpful way of making sense of what it is that's going on. And uh, further making sense about who it is, who we are, there's a couple of studies and articles that have been written about who are animal advocates, who are we? And I'd like to just focus on two of them. The first one is called Caring Sleuths. So the argument here is that animal advocates bring together a combination of... What does it mean? Yes, I'm coming to that. Um, but thank you for your question. Um, and please, if you do have a question, uh, do please do what she just did and, and put your hand up. So Caring Sleuths brings together our sense of caring or compassion that I talked about earlier. And a sleuth is a detective. So perhaps one of the most famous detectives would be Sherlock Holmes, for example. And that's called sleuthing. To sleuth is to investigate. Um, so a caring sleuth is someone who cares but investigates what it is the focus of their caring. So the person who wrote this article called The Caring Sleuth says that animal advocates have five aspects to them. First, they care, which is what we've been talking about with compassion and the other key values. And in caring, they see the suffering. So what we're talking about there is that when we walk past a shop that has meat for sale, you know, we look at that as dead body animal parts. We don't look at it as food. So we see the suffering. And in seeing suffering, we also begin to get so attuned to it that we constantly seek it out. We're looking for it. We're perhaps consciously and subconsciously looking for it. So it could be, for me, the example I always cite, because it's something that I know I do, that if I'm driving down the road, my eyes will sort of constantly be thinking, oh, is there a dog running down the side of the road? Have I got to worry about, am I going to be able to stop so I, don't, uh, I can avoid hitting a dog or a deer, for example? 
So you're seeking it out, you're looking for it. Um, you know, we read the labels on products in the supermarket. And then there's the pervasiveness of the seeking, which what that means is that we um, embody it into our lives. We live and breathe the issue. It, it, it subsumes us, it takes over our life. It's the, the pervasiveness of the seeking. We can't help it. It's who we are, it's what defines us. And as a consequence, we now see what we never used to see, but there's still people who still don't see animal cruelty and exploitation. That, the consequence of that is that there is tensions and conflicts. I'm sure you must all have tensions and conflicts with people who don't feel the same way as we do. So this is an example of, of one way of describing who we are as animal advocates. Does this resonate with you? Do, do you can you identify with this? Yes. Yes, I think that's very much the turning point. What Chris was pointing out was that the, we see the suffering whereas before we didn't see it, and now that we do see it, we want everyone else to see it as well. Um, and uh, people think they do care, and I think people generally do believe they think they care. But you know, I talk to people all the time in my life who care about animals, but then you know, proceed to eat meat in front of me, and I have to restrain myself from my tensions and conflicts with them because I think they're not putting into action what they tell me that they believe. So I, it's a fair point. Um, and then I, I know I've um, got a, a little amount of time, really. I just wanted to also talk about something that Tom Reagan, the philosopher, talked about, which was um, uh, Da Vincians, Damascans, and muddlers. He had a different approach to describing who we are as animal advocates. So he talked about us as being three or a combination of these three. So a Da Vincian, as he describes it, is someone like Leonardo da Vinci, a great thinker, artist, intellect. He had an innate connection with na nature and the animal world and with people. And he, and he was born that way. Um, Damascans, because someone uh, had a personal transformative moment on the road to Damascus, and it changed them. And then muddlers, people who, um, they're, not, they're clearly not Da Vincians, otherwise there would be one, so they're a muddler, um, but they, they seem to go through life trying to figure out what they think and respond to everything that they learn. I kind of think that I've had one or two Damascan moments, but I continue to muddle my life you know, in coping with being uh, learning about animal cruelty and exploitation, knowing what to do about it. So, do you identify with one or more of these categories? Do you think that you're a Da Vincian or a Damascan or a muddler? Yes. <laughs> Come on. Okay. Good. Well, I think you're. I think you are being shy because it's um, it's in the afternoon. So what we've now done is talked about the four key values of compassion, truth, nonviolence, and justice. And uh, because I feel the philosophy of animal ethics is very important, and it hasn't really cropped up so far at this conference, um, uh, at least in the presentations I've seen, I want to spend a couple of minutes talking about animal ethics, because I think these understanding animal ethics is key to understanding why we are who we are. So in animal ethics, um, I'm taking a very complicated and large subject and boiling it down into three basic ideas. And I think there are three traditions in animal ethics, which are utilitarianism, natural rights, and ecofeminism. Now, this is going to be familiar territory for some of you. Um, for others, it may be new ground, and, and it, it may be daunting to think about it, and, and that's fine. I'm not a philosopher. I never went to university. I, have, I don't have a degree in anything. Um, I did go to college, but I learned how to run hotels and restaurants, which has not been very helpful to me. Um, and so I've, I've read these books, and I'm self-taught myself. So I sometimes don't get them 
perfectly uh, correct. So, Animal Liberation by Peter Singer. How many of you have heard or read that book? Well, that's a good number of you. That's about half, um, uh, maybe more than half. Is anyone wanting to give me a definition, a brief, brief definition of what utilitarianism means? Not you, Chris. Yes, please, at the back. Very good. Did everyone hear that? It's basically making decisions to maximize pleasure and minimize pain. And the, um, okay, I've done my 30 minutes. So the uh, point about utilitarianism here with animal ethics is that um, Peter Singer wrote Animal Liberation as a utilitarian philosopher and brought animal ethics into it by saying, um, that because animals are sentient beings, we've got to take their sentiency into account. And normally, utilitarianism, with one or two exceptions, never took animals into consideration. So utilitarianism is a decision whereby you might make decisions, is it better for me to do this or is it better for me to do that? What are the consequences? So uh, if you've read Animal Liberation, that is a good place to start with learning animal ethics. Um, but the difference between utilitarianism and natural rights is significant and important. And, and natural rights does critique utilitarianism. So has anyone here read The Case for Animal Rights by Tom Reagan or read any of his philosophy? Oh, there's quite a few number of hands. That's good. Is anyone wanting to give a quick uh, praise of what the natural rights case is? Or shall I go ahead and just do it? Let me go ahead and just do it. So what it is is that he also starts with the case that animals are sentient beings, and because they're sentient beings, they are subjects of a life. They are individuals, and because they're subjects of a life, an individual, they come with their own inherent rights, and those rights cannot be transgressed. My right doesn't mean that I have a right to transgress your rights, or my right does not give me the power and authority to say your rights don't matter and my rights trump yours. And what Reagan is saying is that because animals are sentient beings, um, they are subjects of a life like we are subjects of a life and consequently um, those rights should be respected. And he talks about the fundamental right to respect. So that's the natural rights view. Then the third tradition in animal ethics is ecofeminism. How many of you have heard of ecofeminism? A couple of you, good. So as the name suggests, what it is, it's a bringing together of ecological thinking with feminism. And basically, um, it's around the ethics of care, um, that everything is interrelated. Um, and the flip side of that is that uh, ecofeminists talk about an intersection of oppression. So utilitarianism, very quickly, um, summing these up, it talks about it's immoral to ignore the suffering of others, um, and we've got to take their suffering into account when we make decisions to create the greater good. Natural rights, it speaks to the issue that animals are individual sentient beings, they're subjects of a life, and consequently they have, no, they have rights. It's not a question of, of my rights are more important than anyone else's rights. And ecofeminism challenges both utilitarianism and natural rights by saying that we, will, we exist in a web of interrelationships. The, there is no concept of rights. There's certainly no decision making based upon the, the, what can we benefit one group over and by taking advantage of, of another. Um, now, I've gone through that really quickly. Um, and I'm happy to answer questions about that because animal ethics has large consequences for the campaigns that we do. And I've been speaking with a couple of people here and elsewhere about how I'm very concerned about the development of uh, effective altruism and using utilitarianism as a device to make decisions um, for social justice purposes. Maybe we can come back to that later. 
So we've now done the first two sections of my talk, and I'm going to go to the final section, which is the five stages of social movements. And in doing social justice work, I've read up a lot about social movement theory and um, looked at the work of others and looked at read biographies of other social justice advocates and tried to simplify down a very complicated process. And when you do that, there's always imperfections, there's always reasons why that's wrong. But for me, when I've worked on this, this makes a lot of sense to me. So I, the way that I see things is that I think there are five stages that a social movement or a social justice issue goes through. Um, we need to progress our way through these five stages, and we also need to be culminate in being active in each one of those five stages simultaneously at the same time. It's not a question of going from one stage onto the next, then onto the next, and onto the next. We have to expand our way through and keep active in the stages that we've moved on from. So the five stages are public education. So this is where we, as it speaks for itself, we talk to the public about animal cruelty and exploitation. We have personal transformative moments. Um, we turn uh, consumers into cruelty-free consumers. And, um, and this is what public education is all about. And as more people become aware and involved and more demands are made upon society, the institutions that make up society begin to adopt public policy. So this is the development of public policy. So this could be businesses um, deciding that they're going to abandon producing eggs from chickens in cages. It could be um, medical schools no longer accepting that it's correct to use dogs killed uh, for practicing surgical skills. It's the institutions, religion, business, uh, academia, um, uh, nonprofits, charities, it's these institutions that make up society. They begin to formulate and adopt positions on animals. And that's the development of public policy. And as that further develops, it trips legislation, which is when laws are passed. And then that quickly follows on when laws are implemented with enforcement. And then we reach the happy day when we have public acceptance and everyone agrees with everyone else. And all along they thought that it was wrong to treat animals the way they did, even though they didn't um, so many years ago. So you can look at social justice issues like gay marriage, um, the expansion of the vote, um, and other social justice issues, and see that they've gone through a process similar to this. And I think that's what's happening with us as the Anne Rice movement. I think principally we operate in the first stage. Increasingly we're operating in the second stage. Um, but we're not doing enough, and this is one of the big points I want to leave you with, I don't think we're doing enough yet to be active in the third and fourth stages. It, it's happening, but it's not happening enough. And, and I see a lot of our work just focused in on the first two stages, which of course there's nothing wrong with that, but I think that we need to also expand our abilities into the third and fourth stages of legislation and enforcement. And, and I, when I say this criticism, I don't mean to, to um, uh, um, belittle or undervalue in any way any group here or outside elsewhere in the world that is already involved with the political process or with the law because they're doing great work. I just wish that we were doing more of it. And I think also that when we now do public educational work, we should also think in terms of what is the public policy, what is the legal aspect to my public educational work. So in this table, what I want to show you is what's said at the bottom there. As a social justice issue progresses through each stage, its influence and resistance to setbacks increases proportionately. In other words, that as we go from minimum influence to maximum influence through the five stages, 
we increase our ability to be influential and be effective in fighting against the animal industrial complex which is wanting to continue to abuse animals. So this line shows that as we go through the five stages, our influence within society increases. Our capacity to accomplish things and make them stick, make them stay, increases. So legislation is very hard to undo once we've got it. Um, it is possible to undo it or amend it, but once a law is on the books, very often it stays there. But public opinion, in contrast, can be tremendously uh, moody and fickle and difficult at times. So let me just reiterate again, the five stages are public education, when people become enlightened about an issue, public policy development, when social um, institutions um, pay attention to the issue, they, get, they adopt sympathetic positions, laws are passed, they're enforced, and we reach a critical mass of public acceptance. And I think you can look at this and think that there are some issues where we've gone further through the five stages than perhaps in other issues. So this leads me to the question that is at the premise of my talk, which is that are we a moral crusade or a social movement? And I deliberately frame it this way uh, as a moral crusade because I think that our advocacy of vegan cruelty-free living very often does take on a, a flavor of being a moral crusade. And I'm being deliberative, deliberately provocative when I say that in, because I want to tease out the point that I think that we need to be more than just a moral crusade, which I think is primarily what we are at the moment. We need to become a social movement or a political movement. We need to become much more sophisticated in our ability to move within the mainstream political arena and fight for animal rights there, which will lead to ultimately um, legislation being passed. So I'm not going to read that out. Can you all read that out the back, out the top there? Yes? Or would you want me to read it out? You can read it. So basically what I'm saying is that um, animal rights is a responsibility of the individual, but it's also an institutional problem and the responsibility of society. And I think very often we think of animal rights as a personal lifestyle choice issue. It is a personal lifestyle choice issue, but it's also as much a mainstream political issue as it is the right to education, to uh, have affordable housing, to um, have a healthcare system, to have an environment that's protected for civil rights for people. This is the fundamental point that I'm trying to make here. So back to my table here, the, here I'm coming back to that line that as we progress through the five stages and remembering that we're staying active in each one as we progress our way through, we emerge from being a moral crusade to being a social movement. And we need to be both. And I think if you can think about other social justice causes, that they've also struggled with the same issue. <coughs> Does that sit well with you? Does that seem to make sense? No? Yes. So, uh, coming to a conclusion now, I'm trying to bring together the points, key points I want to make. And in a talk of this length, um, where I want to cover a broad sweep of issues, I am um, trying to be as succinct as I can be. So, how to growl. We live animal rights as a social justice practice. I think that we should think about our work for animals as a practice, um, as a doctor has a practice, or some other professional has a practice. We should def refine uh, and improve our work as an animal rights advocate, as a social justice practice. And as we live as vegans, we want to be able to live in, as vegans that inspire non-vegans to become vegans. If we live as vegans in such a way that puts people off being vegan, I don't think we're doing any good. We need to support the positive steps in public policy. In many respects, we live in very interesting and exciting times with the emergence of all these new industries and technologies that's, that's creating non-meat meat, meat 
Um, so we need to encourage all those sorts of developments. But we need to represent animals in the mainstream political arena. They need to have, we need to represent their voices within the mainstream political arena. And by the mainstream political arena, I mean the political parties, the mainstream political parties. We should, if, if this is something that you're wanting to do or think about doing, is join political parties and work quietly from within to advance animal welfare, animal rights issues. And I know that um, uh, colleagues here do do that work. So one more way to think about growl is the I've shared with you my four key values of compassion, truth, nonviolence, and justice. Maybe you should think about what your key values are. You don't have to accept mine. I, you know, just because I've got their mine, they can be yours if you want them, but I'm not telling you that they should be. But what I do suggest is that you think about what is it that if you boiled it down to the essence, why do you care the way that you do? And I would encourage you to learn more about the animal ethics, because philosophy and moral thinking helps to clarify what is going on, often in our scrambled brains and minds, where we're trying to unravel what it is that we're actually thinking. And I've had many a moment, good moment, when I've been reading a, a, a philosopher's work um, and reading something and going, that's right, that's exactly what I thought. But I needed to read someone else and how they've articulated it in order for me to actually understand it, that that's what I was thinking as well. And then think about the fact that in our work for animals, it's a grand sweep, it's a grand nar narrative, that this is a marathon, it isn't a sprint. This is a lifetime's work. And it's gonna be a, a work that's gonna continue beyond all of our lifetimes. I know that when I got involved with animal rights, I was quite an arrogant, angry, bitter, mean, frustrated young man. And when I got involved with animal rights, I thought the animal rights movement started because I had found it. But then I learned and realized from talking to people and reading books, there was actually decades, if not centuries, of work in animal rights, animal welfare, humane action that preceded my involvement with it. And we need to know our history. We need to understand how society changes, how it works. We're not very well taught this in school. Um, we may go to study at college. But very often we're kept ignorant of the power and control within society and how we can tap into it to advance animal issues. <coughs> so in my conclusion, I want to say we need to understand animal rights as a moral crusade to inspire individual change and a social movement to achieve institutional change. Animal rights is a moral crusade and a social movement. I'm not advocating that it's one or the other. It is both, but I think we're mostly focused on it being a moral crusade at this point in time. And with that, I'd like to thank you for being such a patient audience. Thank you.